Okay, so what I'd like to do now is to start to uh, adjourn into a, uh, you know, the next topic in here. So um, maybe I want to turn the lights down a little bit. Is that better? Um, okay. So what I'd like to t do now is to talk about, uh, get us started in the second half of the course. The first half of the course was very much about what I will call string algorithms and well-defined string algorithms for doing things like assembly and, you know, homology detection, string searching, stuff like that. The second half of the course is going to involve what I'm going to call generally messier, probably more biologically e problems. Okay, so it's going to get us into things on certain pattern recognition problems where it is not such a well-defined thing sometimes, what you're looking for. And there is a wide variety of interesting problems in the world that fall into this category, interesting and important problems in here. And so we're going to spend some time, the, the basic vision for the rest of the semester is we'll talk about a biologically important, bioinformatically important problem talk enough about the biology, why people care about it, what the clues, cues are that you might be able to do something with, and then talk about what are reasonable algorithmic approaches to try to deal with this kind of thing. And so this will introduce us to, you know, certain, you know, computational technologies that are interesting things, that are relevant for these things. For gene finding, which is the next topic in here, the main thing is going to be hidden Markov models, okay? But I'd like to spend today at talking about what the gene finding problem is, and this will get us into a little bit more biology again, but I think we're about ready for that. Okay? Any questions here about what we're trying to do here? Okay, so let me see if I can do this. Okay, so right now where we are in this semester is so far we've spent uh, the first chapter on sequence assembly, so we have this idea that you can go from molecules to uh, DNA molecules to data in a database, showing what that organism's sequence is. We have talked about sequence similarity detection, which means that if you have a sequence that you think is interesting, you can now go through this database and find where are there other sequences like this one. Okay, and these are important things. But there are other um, issues that are important. Um, and one is basically trying to annotate DNA sequence data, right? So if I, you know, if, you know, in principle, if I got your ge genome, if I sequenced you, what I'm going to, I know what I'm going to see. I'm going to see a pattern of 3 billion A, C, Gs, and Ts that by itself has no meaning. Does everybody get that idea? It's just a pattern, it's just a, a pattern of, of characters. Now, there are biologically important things in it, and the annotation problem is to take as input a database sequence, okay, a new genome or a new freshly sequenced piece of DNA, and identify what is interesting about it, okay, what parts of it are interesting. We talked it here how something like about 2% of uh, the genome of a, you know, the, you know, in a typical mammal, about 2% of the coding sequence represents genes which make proteins. This 2% is, you know, one among the more interesting parts of the genome. And so trying to go from this pattern of, you know, ACGs and Ds to telling me where the genes are, okay, is an important and interesting step. Okay, does everybody get that idea? The question that we're going to be interested in is, how do we identify these features? Um, again, the most important features are genes. Those were the um, coding sequences that basically told us how to make proteins. Okay? And, um, you know, since, you know, the genes and uh, the other sites on the genome associated with those genes are the important candidates for where there are, you know, if you want to find a drug, you want to know what the proteins are, what they do. You'd like to know how they're turned on and off. Identifying the regions on the genome where all this stuff is done is important. Okay? And so whenever you do a genome sequencing project, part of it is a uh, laboratory work. You go and say, okay, 
I want to sequence the panda. There was a big problem project in China to sequence the panda. Okay? And so part of it is you have guys who go to the, you know, go to a panda and rip some part of the panda off. Okay? Hopefully just a few cells. Okay? And you extract DNA and you amplify it. And you feed an army of sequencing machines and you get the data and you assemble it. And then the second part, before they can publish it and say we're done, you have to identify where the genes are. And if you just sort of sent in a paper to a journal that said, here is the sequence of the panda, here's three billion base pairs, do what you want with it. Okay, that's not impressive. You want to know how the panda works. You want to know what, what are the genes, how does the panda differ from its nearest relative that's been sequenced, and things like that. Any questions? So annotation is an important part of the job. And let's look at uh, how we can do such things, okay? So in order to think about a gene, remember a gene was the part of the genome that described how to make a protein. There's sort of two steps in the process of making proteins. Remember we talked about the, they call it the central dogma, where you have a DNA, a portion of that gets copied into RNA, then the RNA is somehow interpreted according to triple code, right? To get interpreted uh, in groups of three so that you can then read off the protein. Does everybody get that idea? So if we want to recognize where on the genome sequence it is, it should be clear that there's two biological, pro that represents a gene, there's two biological processes which are important. One is trying to figure out where this transcription starts and ends, right? And the other is of this piece of RNA that co copied, where is the part that is really describing what are the amino acids that are in the protein, okay? Any questions about that? So in order to try to recognize genes, we should understand something more about the biology of this process. Does that make sense? And so that will help sort of frame what the computational problem is. So what is transcription? Transcription is the first part of our task. It is involved the copying from DNA to RNA. Okay? And if you think about it, this is so part of what is goes into identifying a gene is going about where is this copying process starting, right? Nature is no doing this copying process, right? So somehow the cell has figured out what to copy, okay? And if we could understand how the cell is doing it, that might help us guide writing a program for it. Does that make sense? So how does this process work? And it's very, very complicated. Um, but one way to think about it, a way I would think about it, is that there is this enzyme, okay, called polymerase, that binds typically to a pattern, you know, 10 to 35 bases before the gene to start the copying process. So the way I think about what's happening here is here's a, a, a DNA molecule floating around, in, you know, in, in the cell. There are certain patterns on this sequence, which molecules that are floating, protein molecules, a polymerase molecule, can float onto and can bind to, okay? And once it binds, polymerase is the thing that starts the copying process and sort of walks along the molecule, you know, doing the copying, okay? So one good thing would be to figure out where is the place where it binds. That is probably the start of a, that, that, that is a good signal for a start of a gene, okay? Any questions about that, okay? The other thing, though, that makes this complicated is that there are a lot of other signals that go into this polymerase binding, okay? But the way that I kind of picture the process is there is a DNA sequence, your genomic DNA, there are various uh, you know, molecules that, that, that if they bind in the right place will start copying RNA, okay? And these are binding at certain signals. Um, and then either being supported or uh, inhibited by other binding sites, okay? So let me show you a picture of this, okay? Or a cartoon. They call these things cartoons. Let's look at this and boom. 
Okay. So this is kind of what I would say is a cartoon of what the um, the initiation of transcription looks like. This blue line over here represents the DNA molecule, right? Okay. A um, you know there is the, the binding site in at least some species is called a tata box, a TATA -T -A symbol. It's kind of an important thing. Okay? So what typically happens is something like this, that something binds to this signal. There's typically, but not always, a signal that's about 35 base streams up the start of where you want the copying to start. A molecule will stick to this type. Okay? And then other things also stick to it, okay? So the way I think of again, it's, it's hard to get a, a picture in my head as to what is happening in a cell, okay? I mean, you know, I have this image of a lot of proteins and RNA molecules and things like that swimming around in this region in the cell, okay? And they're being driven by not much more than uh, than physical forces. It's not like the cells, are, these proteins are, or, or chemicals are smart moving around. They are basically moving around in response to uh, things like charge. Positively charged things are going to be attracted by negatively charged things. Certain things want to bind, you know, because you know that, that bases want to bind to their complement, right? Certain amino acid things will want to bind with or, you know, be happy binding to certain patterns on DNA, okay? And so what's happening is that you have these molecules swimming around, they're vibrating rapidly, all kinds of things are happening. Sometimes they bunk, in, the right molecule bunks into the right place, and then it sticks, right? Until it lets go, because these, I think each of these molecules is vibrating and, yeah. Uh, it's not even clear to biologists what exactly happens Okay, so he says, he, bi our biologist says it's not clear what happens to, to the, the, in here. What's clear is that this is somehow happening by, you know, my model is, all this is being driven by some physical forces going on, these electrostatic forces or, you know, molecular dynamics issues, okay? But basically what kind of happens is that if the right molecule binds to the right thing, it sticks. Other things will then maybe stick to it. Okay, so I kind of picture what happens is, you know, the, uh, the DNA molecule is wiggling around. This thing sticks to it, right? Then other molecules are going to stick to it. Maybe this protein st now, now stick to this assembled thing, right? There are other proteins that stick to DNA molecules. Maybe there's other signals further downstream of what we're doing. Proteins will stick to this, and now this thing is going to fold and swing over and stick to this protein. And now enough proteins and stuff have gotten stuck on here that it's going to be relatively stable. Again, I picture a world where molecules are wiggling rapidly and doing all kinds of strange things, okay? And it's hard for to develop an intuition for this. But let's try an experiment. Think about this thought experiment. Suppose you take a, a coffee cup, you put a nickel in the coffee cup, then you pour boiling water in the coffee cup, right, and let it cool just enough so it stops steaming. You then call your roommate over and say, hey, reach down and pick up the nickel. What is going to happen? Okay. What? What's supposed to happen is the roommate's supposed to scream, right? because the water is near boiling. Why is the roommate going to scream? Okay? It's because somehow all these molecules are banging against their fingers so fast, right? So, I mean, part of me has this image of, yeah, life is just molecules drifting around. They're really, these things are moving fast and they're hammering into you, and that's what happens when you get burned, is my intuition of these things. So cells are somehow these very active environments of all these molecules stuck together, very energetic, wiggling around. Okay, when the right things bind and the right other things bind to them, then this can get locked into place. The polymerase is now locked into place. If it's locked into place long enough, then it can start wiggling along the sequence, copying things. 
until it falls off. And it basically falls off when you get a palindrome of uh, A's, flanking repeated A's, forming a knot, okay? So the way I think about it is, if the DNA forms, has a palindrome in it, then it's going to sort of form a knot like this. And I kind of have this picture of it wiggling and then falling off when it hits that thing, okay? So that's a basic idea of how the transcription works, okay? Any questions about that? Okay. Yes. Ah, so the question is, how does this thing for fold when it's uh, double-stranded like that? The truth is that in parts of its life cycle, DNA is double-stranded. And in parts of its life cycle, DNA is single-stranded. So my picture of this is that there are bubbles that form in the DNA where it sort of opens up at certain points. When, 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 when it's getting, you know, the, when, when the cellular machine and parts of it open up, okay, and now it's single-stranded and it will now do its thing, okay? <coughs> yeah. Right, so the polymerase is not just, we're not impressed that the polymerase is walking along the molecule. The main thing that we're impressed with is that it's walking along and copying it at the same time, right? So, you know, I kind of picture this molecule walking along. Again, this, I'm going to say, it's, I'm picturing it as a similar process to, um, you know, we'll, we'll talk about uh, translation in a minute where there is clearly a, you know, physical thing I, I understand better. But I'm picturing a world where there's sort of a molecule walking around here, which is going to retrieve the proper next base, okay? And it knows what the next base is because it's kind of got to bind with on some level. This is a C in the DNA world, right? Somehow the opposing base is going to have to bind to this thing and then get held and get bound into an RNA molecule that's going along, okay? So the question is, do you assume that the L cell has an infinite supply of ACGs and Ds? And for our purposes, we'll say yes. Now, it doesn't have an infinite supply, but it has a lot, and it does recycle it. Okay? So it makes a messenger RNA, and then it uses it for a while, and then it degrades it to chop it up back into ACGs and Ts. Right? And so that's, I guess, how I would handle the infinite supply issue. Okay? Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. So is it like that that's the only difference? Right? So the way I think, the, the, the difference between DNA and RNA? DNA we say is A, C, G, and T. Uh, you know, um, RNA is A, C, G, and U, okay? From the information point of view, that's not an interesting difference. The important thing is that DNA is a different chemical than RNA, right? different kind of molecule. It has different kinds of properties to it, okay? So the U is a different chemical than, you know, um, than, than the T, okay? Is, a, I guess, a way to think about it. So from an information theory point of view, it's not any different. It doesn't sound that exciting. From a chemical point of view, RNA behaves differently than DNA for certain things, okay? And so a way to think about what this copying is, I am copying it from one format, the DNA molecule format, into the RNA molecule format. Okay? Does that make sense? But the A is always mapped to A's and... A's are always mapped to A's, C's are always mapped to C's, G's are always mapped to G's, T's are always mapped to U. Okay? Is the way to think about what happens on the copy. Any questions? Okay? But it's a different molecule which, you know, the, the, ke the chemical properties of it are different enough to be interesting, okay? Any questions? Okay? Good. Um, so any questions about how transcription happens? Okay? And again, there was, it's funny, there used to be, well, I don't think it's there, there, there was, used to be these wonderful videos at the Museum of Natural History. I think they, may, they must may still be around someplace in one of the exhibit halls. Um, which sort of showed how fast these things copy. 
These things copy at like hundreds of spaces per second is the rate that I picture this is happening, right? Search YouTube. Search YouTube. Oh, search YouTube. You can probably get an idea of this thing. So part of me has this image of all oh, these molecules randomly bunking into each other. It's a nice, slow, laserly thing. These things are happening hundreds of bases per second. The right thing is bunking into it. So you look at bop, 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 bop. Okay? This copy can happen quite fast. Okay? And that's because molecules are small and there are a lot of them and they do their thing as molecules do. Any questions? Okay? So it's really an interesting thing to look on YouTube. If anybody finds a good YouTube video, you send me the link. I'll put it on the web page. Any questions? Okay? So that is tra transcription. The second part is translation, okay? And this is now, I am giving you the RNA molecule, okay? And this RNA molecule was started to copy at some point, okay? And there is some other point on it, not necessarily right where you started, but maybe near, the, you know, a certain amount of bases in from the start, where the triples of the triples correspond to the amino acid sequence that we want to make, right? There is a complicated, very complicated molecule called the ribosome, okay, that basically walks along the RNA sequence, okay, grabbing an appropriate amino acid for the next codon, okay, and adding it to the chain of the given protein, okay? And like I say, these things are basically still done by random motion, molecular motion, and electrostatic char forces and things like that. So if we look at this, we have a um, microscope, you know, uh, uh, is this actually clear? Let me, is there a way to make this lighter? Does anyone know how to change the contrast here? Um, is there anybody who knows how to change contrast on these things? This is a someone who wants to run up and do this quickly. Do I have, oh, it's got to be on the projector? I don't have any sense for the yeah. projector. Okay, never mind. Let's look at what this is. This is a microscope, a, a, supposed to be a, a picture taken in a microscope, okay, of what it looks like. I, this is really a cartoon. It's not a microscopic thing. But let me tell you what you're seeing here. And you can look at the notes if, since we can't seem to see it. This here is the RNA molecule. See, when you look at the RNA under a microscope, you see the pattern it makes, right? That's a U, C, C, A, A, right? That's the, the, the RNA slides through this thing. This green molecule you're barely seeing, but you will see a lot better if you look at the notes online, okay? Is a ribosome, and the ribosome is, looks like, as far as I'm concerned, if you look at it from the side, I have the image of it looking like this. Okay? And there is this read right head that is coming along, okay, positioning the RNA as it slides through this ribosome. Does that make sense? And what is happening now is once you get registered in the R ribosome, there's room for three bases in the mouth of this thing, right? And what happens is Three bases of the RNA are exposed, and there are a lot of molecules floating around in the solution called transfer RNAs, tRNAs. And a tRNA is a piece of RNA which has two ends on it. It's, something, it's a piece of RNA that folded into a certain shape. One end of the shape is specialized so that it binds at only a particular pattern, C. G, A, right? The other end of it is a holster that will hold exactly one of the 20 amino acids to it. So I picture this transfer RNA as this interface thing that has two plugs on it. One plug is something that matches a triple of RNA. The other of which is a holster that holds a particular type of amino acid, right? There are 20 of these kind of units. There are 64-ish of these kind of units, right? And so what happens? When one of these units wanders around, if 
what is exposed is something that matches this tRNA. When it gets bunked into this thing, okay, it will bind, right? And it will put that amino acid sequence, that amino acid that it's holding, into a particular place. Does that kind of make sense? And the place where it is happens to be another part of this, this uh, ribosome holds the, the amino acid chain that it's building, right? And it holds this next to this, and it decides to bind there. Bind there. Once they hold it long enough, something happens, and this gets added to the chain, right? Then the molecule gives a hiccup and slides over, and the chain slides over, and this slides over, and there is now a new three bases exposed here, right? And the growing amino acid sequence moves further on. Does that make sense? Okay. So really the way that this works is that there are these tRNAs, this, for our purposes, let's say 61 of these kind of tRNAs. Why 61? There are 64 possible triples, right? One of three of them and 64 triples, three of them are what we call stop symbols, right? So these presumably don't have an RTRNA in it for them, okay? And you can kind of imagine maybe it stalls out for a while. If nothing hits it, it eventually it falls off. Or is there actually something that binds to it on a stop? There is something. There's something that binds to it, okay? There's sort of a, a, get, you know, a special binding thing that binds to it that says no more, okay, dislodge, okay? Any questions about that? Okay? So the mechanism of this is, is sort of, again, if you look at this thing, here, if you, I urge you to, I'm, I'm sorry this, this, this doesn't show up very well, but again, this green thing is the complicated uh, ribosome. Here are, is the chain of amino acids that has been built. Here is the triple that got bound. A transfer RNA stood up to this thing, holding this amino acid, S, and this gets gets red, and then the thing unit shifts over here. Okay? Any questions? This does not happen at hundreds of bases a second, as I understand. This happens at, I will say, tens of bases a second, or something like this. So I'm happy to be corrected. Okay? The long this is a slower process. Okay? Basically, these things get copied that way. Any questions about that? So. This is sort of the physical process that we're looking to try to identify where it is happening on the genome. Any questions about that? Okay, so just go back just to make sure we haven't missed anything here. Translation, we have a ribosome doing the walking. Okay, it grabs the appropriate transfer RNA. Okay, for the next triple, that's really what it's saying. And adds it to the end of the given protein. Okay, any questions? And so our problem is now, given as input a DNA molecule, find out where the molecules are doing this, right? Arguably, you are smarter than a molecule. So if the molecules can figure this out, arguably you should be able to. Or at least you should be able to write a program to try to figure this thing out. Any questions? And that is the problem of gene recognition. Any questions? Okay, so let's now look um, in a deeper sense at what the problem actually is. Hold on a second. Boom, boom. So, there's a little bit more biology we have to see here, which is that there is a complication that makes gene prediction a lot harder in higher organisms. We've had this image here so far that a gene is a triple, you know, a series of triples ending in a stop symbol, right? And it started at some point, it was a triple that ended there. It turns out that in eukaryotes, okay, genes don't occur, the coding sequence does not occur as a continuous run of DNA, okay, or RNA, uh, or, or, or DNA. That on the genomic DNA, there is a coding sequence, which is what we call an exon, 
okay? And before the protein that we want actually ends, there will be an interruption and there'll be a bunch of junk sequence called an intron, okay? Before there is more exon and then possibly another, okay, intron. And so the protein is really described not as a contiguous sequence of triples in the genomic DNA, but as a hunk of different exons that when you concatenate them, forms the protein. Does that make sense? Okay. This is a weird thing. It, you know, if I were designing life, it's not obvious I would have designed it this way. But no one asked me. Okay. Is that clear? <laughs> and what is clear is that somehow when you look at how this stuff really happens, the process of DNA to a protein gets more complicated. Okay. We had this idea that DNA gets copied into a messenger RNA. That is really just a direct copy. That would include the introns, right? Something has to splice out the introns. That kind of makes sense. The ribosome is going to go read this thing. If you give it junk, and that junk might be an end, uh, an end of uh, pro, you know, a, a, a stop symbol, in which case it would fall off. So it's clear that the junk's got to be gone before the ribosome reads this thing. So the molecule has some way of splicing this thing out, okay? And so it copies the junk, then it splices out the intron. And from this, it reads off the amino acid sequence. That's the protein, right? And then, in fact, I have this picture of the protein chain drifting off nicely into space. In fact, this is folding into some kind of a shape. So I'm kind of picturing that as it's getting spit out of the ribosome, somehow this protein is bending and kinking up, okay? And you shove out some more, and it's going to bend into a different shape, right? And finally, it gets cut off, and it's probably going to fold into a final shape, okay? And that's sort of the problem by which pro proteins are created. Any questions? Okay? So when we do gene recognition, our goal really is not to recognize this. Our goal is to recognize which pieces, okay, correspond to exons, which end up getting spliced into the upper pro into the, a given protein. Any questions about it? So why is it that there that, that, that life works this way? Okay, why is it that uh, that um, genes are 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 not contiguous proteins in higher organisms? Okay, and this is not completely known, but there are some ideas reasons why there might be advantages. One reason is if you want to make a protein, you want to have you know one of the things that that's the, one of the reasons why um, you know. A species will, you know, species when they evolve, the easier it is for organisms to evolve new functions, that is a competitive advantage, right? If you can't evolve new proteins or you can't evolve new functions for proteins, then there isn't much an organism can do to change, right? If you are a slime mold and all you're going to do is to, you, you, it's demand, I, all my descendants must always have exactly the same set of genes as me. All your descendants will be slime molds. Is that clear? So why might it be easier to evolve new protein functions if you have split genes? One thing that might happen is if I have one big protein, okay, I can't make big changes to this protein with one mutation. Is that pretty much clear? I can only make little dot by dot changes, right? But if I have my genes in big hunks like this, in hunks of exons, how might I evolve a, fun a new functionality? One might be, suppose I make one base change here which fools the splicing machinery. So it no longer gets spliced in, right? Now the resulting protein is going to be this followed by that, right? And that might kill the organism, or it might lead to a new functionality. Is that right? 
Or maybe I can have a world where there is some variable change, where sometimes this gets spliced in, and sometimes this gets spliced out. And now I can basically get the equivalent of two proteins for the price of one. Does that kind of make sense? So, you know, um, you know, what's, I, I'm not, you know, uh, you know, if this was it, okay, um, you know, if uh, cats, I don't know, if, uh, uh, I'm not going to come up with a, a funny example here, but you could imagine that if, if we take a look at this, if sometimes the T doesn't work, right, then sometimes you get cats, sometimes you get cas, okay, and maybe both molecules do you something good, okay, so you can make multiple proteins per gene. Any questions about that? So we're going to have to deal with the fact that genes exist as these hunks of um, exons unless you insist on only finding genes in bacteria. Okay, if you want to do something interesting, you've got to worry about finding exons. Any questions? So what is the real picture of this kind of thing? Okay. The other thing to know, just to make the problem just a little bit more biologically complicated, to realize just how complicated the world is, is that, you know, different molecules and cells do things in different parts of cells. Okay? Cells have this thing called the nucleus. Okay? And, you know, within the nucleus, and, and these molecules move around, okay, but they do certain things in different parts of cells. So the truth is that somehow that the, um, you know, the DNA sits in the nucleus of a cell. The copy of it, the transcription, happens within the nucleus of the cell. The splicing, where you take out the exons, happens in the nucleus of the cell. The proteins are actually made outside the, the nucleus in something called the cytoplasm. Okay? And that's where the translation happens. So we're not going to care about this very much, but it's important to recognize that what makes a lot of things happen in biology are how do proteins move from one part of the cell to the other, okay? How do they signal? How do they do these things? What sticks to what where, okay? And this is, these are forces that govern a lot of what goes on. We're going to not really talk much about that. But if you talk to, you know, biologists long enough, you'll see they care about molecules do what where. We're still only interested in the part list, right? Any questions here? Okay. So how can we now say with this thing, how can we now hope to recognize genes? Okay? There are certain features in gene sequences which turn out to be helpful for us that we might be able to use as clues to write a gene prediction program. Okay? One is that these introns, the gaps between the coding sequences, have what they call donor and acceptor sites associated with them. Namely, intron basically starts with a GT usually and ends with an AG, AG usually. Why is that? It goes to something to do with how are these introns spliced out. The way that I picture is happening, the RNA folds into some kind of a knot. Here is the exon. Here is the exon. Here is the intron that's going to get spliced out.